today on the Perception in Action podcast. Does the kinetic chain link in the expected proximal to distal order? Does it link in the same way with each execution of a movement? To foreshadow, no and no. A look at work on kinematic sequencing in throwing. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I want to look at some really interesting new research that finds one of my favorite things in the world to discover, movement variability in unexpected places. One of the most fundamental concepts in movement science and biomechanics is the kinetic chain. That is the sequential transfer of energy or force through the body. For example, when pitching a baseball, I want to take energy from the ground by pushing off from it and sequentially move that through my lower body, torso, upper body, arm, and then the hand in that order. Each of these body parts is a link in the chain. This kinetic chain is, of course, produced by sequential positions and movements of different body parts, commonly called the kinematic sequence. Imagine that I measured the velocity of five different body parts while you're pitching a baseball or swinging a golf club the pelvis, trunk, arm, forearm, and hand. Each of these velocities is going to increase and then decrease as the movement progresses. But if we look at the timing of when the maximum angular velocity occurs for each, we would expect to see a proximal to distal sequence. If we want to transfer the maximal force to the ball, the peak velocity of the pelvis rotation should occur before the peak velocity of the trunk, which is before the peak velocity of the upper arm, etc., Think about what we would have if a body segment continued to increase in velocity after it had passed its force on to the next link in the chain. This would be wasteful because it's not going to be transferred to the ball in the end. Having out of sequence, kinematic sequencing, is also likely to produce injury, and indeed this has been shown. For example, in baseball, having a maximal pelvis rotation that occurs after the maximal trunk rotation has been associated with increased external shoulder and elbow torques, which can increase the risk of a shoulder or UCL elbow injury. In baseball training, one of the ways we try to encourage the development of good sequencing is by focusing on throwing only fastballs as kids are young, because this tends to encourage it. So the bottom line is that to have a solid kinetic chain, we should produce a proximal to distal kinematic sequence. But do we? In a study published in 2020, Donna Moxley and colleagues examined kinematic sequencing in baseball pitching. For this, they measured the angular velocity of five body segments, the pelvis, the trunk, the upper arm, the forearm, and the hand of pitchers while they were throwing fastballs in a motion tracking lab. The main analysis involved identifying the order of the maximal angular velocity of each of these segments. There were a total of 22 pitchers, five high school, 11 college, and six professionals, The main predictions were that one, across all pitches analyzed, the primary kinematic sequencing pattern of peak segment angular velocity should follow the progression from proximal to distal, that is pelvis to trunk to upper arm to forearm to hand, and two, there would be greater intra-pitcher variability of the kinematic sequencing among the high school pitchers than either the college or professionals. What was found? Note, in discussing this, I'm going to use numbers to represent the different body segments. So one is the pelvis, two is the torso, three is the arm, etc. Of the total of 208 pitches analyzed, how many actually involved the predicted proximal to distal 
one, two, three, four, five order. Exactly none. This ideal sequencing never occurred in their study. The closest was a one, two, three, five, four pattern in which the maximal velocity of the hand occurred before the maximal velocity of the forearm. Even this only occurred on about a third of the trials. For the 208 pitches thrown, there were a total of 14 different kinematic sequences identified. Okay, what if we accept the one, two, three, five, four pattern as close enough to the ideal proximal to distal kinematic sequencing? Then surely it was the professional pitchers that did that the most often. Nope. It was the high school pitchers that performed that most often. They did it 45% of the time, while the pros only had it about 38% of their pitches. Okay, well, obviously what we're seeing here are unique movement solutions appropriate for each pitcher's individual constraints. Well, when we look across different pitchers, they may not all have the same kinematic sequence. Surely each pitcher performs the same kinematic sequence with each execution of their own movement. Uh, no. Only two out of the 22 pitchers performed the same kinematic sequence on each delivery. Nine of the pitchers had two distinct sequences, three performed at least five or six. Well, of course, it must have been the professional pitchers that were the most consistent in their kinematic sequencing. Nope. Across all the levels of play, the high school pitchers performed the least amount of kinematic sequence patterns. It was not even the case that the kinematic sequences always fell within the same phase of the movement. For pitching, we typically divide the movement into five phases. Wind up, stride, arm cocking, acceleration, and deceleration and follow through as the last one. For 56% of the trials, peak pelvis angular velocity occurred in the cocking phase. In 44% of the trials, it occurred during the stride phase. What's more, the peak velocities did not always occur before the ball was actually released by the pitcher. To quote the authors, the ideal proximal to distal kinematic sequencing pattern would be performed with the ball released at the moment of peak hand velocity to allow that final transfer of velocity to the ball. However, in our data set, we observed that in the majority of the pitches, all three upper extremity peak angular velocities, the upper arm, the forearm, and the hand, occurred after ball release or in the deceleration and follow through phase. We've got movement variability for days here, my friends, both between pitchers and within different executions by the same pitcher, and no real evidence of the perfect kinetic chain. In a follow-up study in 2021, the same authors looked at the relationship between kinematic sequencing and both performance and markers for injury. For this, they took data from 30 pitchers, different ones, of different skill levels, and they identified, again, 17 different patterns. For this study, they classified these into four different types. The first was the almost proximal to distal sequencing. Again, of the 249 pitches analyzed, there was not one instance of the ideal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 kinematic sequence. The closest this time was a 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 pattern, where the hand and the forearm reached their maximal velocity simultaneously. That occurred for about 12% of the trials. The other sequences were classified based on when the deviation from proximal to distal occurred. Sequence number two was when the chain was broken by the hand being out of order. So for example, one, two, three, five, four. This occurred on roughly 74% of the pitches. Sequence number three was when the forearm or upper arm was the first segment out of order. For example, one, two, four, five, three. This occurred 32% of the time. Finally, sequence number four was when the pelvis or the trunk, that is your core, broke the sequence. For example, 21344, four, which occurred on roughly 10% of the trials. Something to emphasize here. As you can see in this study and in the previous one, the kinematic sequencing is observed did not just have one segment out of order. For example, the hand always a bit earlier. There were a ton of different patterns found. The analyses involved comparing the pitch speeds and measured torques in the shoulder and elbow for these four different classified kinetic sequences. What was found? Looking at performance first, surely the almost proximal to distal kinematic sequence, one, two, three, four, four, should have produced the highest pitch velocity. It's the closest to keeping the kinematic chain intact after all. Um, Nope. <laughs> there was no significant difference in pitch velocity for the four different segment classifications. What about markers for injury? Here the results were a bit mixed. 
yes, the torque in the shoulder and elbow was lowest for the almost proximal to distal kinematic sequence, but there was no actual significant differences. For the elbow torque, again, the proximal to distal sequences did have the lowest value, but it was only significantly different from the sequences in which the hand broke the pattern. So in sum, this study again shows that baseball pitchers do not throw the ball with the ideal kinematic sequencing. And the kinematic sequencing closest to the ideal does not actually result in better performance in terms of pitch velocity, nor is it clearly or consistently better in terms of injury risk as measured by torques in the elbow and shoulder. So what does all this mean? First off, let's point out that these variations in kinematic sequencing are likely to be much larger on the field. For these studies mentioned, the constraints are as constant as possible. Pitcher throwing the same pitch over and over, from the same mound, no batter, no fatigue, no weather, etc. Once these things start changing in the game, we should expect to see even more variability in the kinematic sequencing. Furthermore, pitching is a self-paced closed skill. What are we going to find when we look at a reactive open skill like baseball batting? Clearly, the sequencing of the movement of different body parts is not just about transferring force optimally. There are other things going on too. First, there are motor synergies. It's not as simple as moving the pelvis, then the trunk, then the upper arm, because these things vary and need to work together. As the authors say, quote, the timing of the upper extremity segment peaks may be demonstrative of the variation of motor skill level in coordinating ball release at the time of peak hand velocity. The elite fast pitch players likely harness the timing of peak hand velocity closest to ball release, end quote. The second possibility is that these variations in kinematic sequencing might be yet another example of variability as an injury prevention mechanism. To quote the authors, it has been proposed that kinematic and temporal spatial variability may be protective against repetition-induced injury. This concept should be considered in the analyses of the kinematic sequencing in sports with known cases of repetitive strain injury, such as baseball pitching. The ability to have variation in strain incurred across muscle skeletal structures during pitching may lessen the total cumulative effects of the strain. The experienced pitchers may achieve longevity in the sport through utilization of various kinematic sequencing patterns, end quote. So in sum, while this variation in kinematic sequencing complicates the simple story of the kinetic chain we like to tell, it may have other benefits. Looking forward to seeing more work on this topic in the future. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now, and keep them coupled.